All right. What if I put this over here? Uh, is everybody sitting with their group? Anybody need to get up and move? You guys are all seated. Somebody's got to get up and move. All right. Um, so in, I, I get it. If your group members are not here, if not all your group members are here, you don't have to have a full group. But I'd like you guys to, uh, to sit with your group so that you get some experience of knowing them. Um, one, of my, one of my goals with all the classes that I teach one of my goals, yeah. I guess the primary goal is that you guys get something of value out of the class. Is that fair? Is that a good goal? Um, a secondary goal that's not quite as important as that, but it's kind of important. You guys have uh, you, you've read the, uh, the WPI policies on cheating and stuff like that, right? right? You guys have all read those policies? You're supposed to be familiar with them? In fact, I think the syllabus even tells you to read the policies. I, I, used to, I used to quiz people on knowing what's the difference between cheating and not cheating in the class. And, and I do know that there are some faculty. So do you know that if I suspect you of cheating, I must report it to the, the council's office. There's a council for this. If I suspect it, I must report it. Do you know that that's a big hassle for everybody? Especially if I'm wrong, if I'm, it doesn't matter if I'm wrong or if I'm right, right? So I have endeavored with all of my classes to make it impossible for you to cheat. You are required to collaborate with each other when you work on your quizzes. Therefore, if you collaborate with each other when you work on your quizzes, it is impossible for you to cheat. Now there is an exception to this. When we do the final exam at the end of the class, I very specifically tell you do not collaborate with each other when working on this assignment. Does that make sense? Because that final exam sort of separates whether or not you learned anything or the group just drug you along. Because it's possible if you're allowed to collaborate and you're encouraged to collaborate that the group could just drug you along, right? It's entirely possible. You should endeavor to learn something while getting drug. Dragged. Drug. I think drug's the best word for this phrasing while getting drug along by the group. So yesterday, the theme was what, was, what was, what was the condition to get a piece of candy yesterday? Answer a question. Would you believe that the class should get harder as it goes along? At least in some people's opinions. Today, what do you believe the criteria for getting a piece of candy is? Yes. Part of correctly. Well, it's honestly, I have to believe it's the correct answer, right? At least I didn't hit anybody in the head. Um, all right, so today, if I believe you've answered a question correctly, I'll throw a piece of candy in, in your general direction. Um, as the class goes on, I have to actually think it's an important question also. And then finally, I just get tired and I just say, come take candy if you need candy. Uh, if, it needs, if you need the sugar to stay awake. So... Yesterday, we ended up with an equation, right? Anybody remember the equation we ended with yesterday? Yeah. Uh, I think we only had one equation yesterday, no? Oh, two equations. Okay, but we ended with power. Power equals force times velocity, right? So power equals force times velocity. Now, what, what was the other thing? If we wanted to estimate power, what did we, uh, what did we want to consider? So if we're going to, so this is, this is math. If we measure force and we measure velocity, power equals that. That's not an estimate. That's math. It is. 
If we wanted to estimate the power to make a cut before we start cutting, and I don't care if you remember the, the variable names, just give me the descriptions. What are the things that we need to know in order to estimate the power before we start cutting? So power, so this is equals. I guess our estimate is an equals too, but it's like a less drastic equals. Doesn't math have a symbol for a less drastic equals? Like sort of equal to? There's like some squigglies or something, but squigglies have a specific meaning too. Is, can, is, there, a, is there an equals with like a squiggly on top or something? What does that mean? What's that? It's congruent, yeah. Anyway, but you guys know what I mean. It's equals, but it's equals because we're estimating. It's not equals because we know. All right, so uh, power equals what? What goes into it? Yeah. So we need the material removal rate, and the machinery's handbook calls that Q. What else do we need to know? Yes. Oh, I'm slacking. I'm way slacking on the job here. Go. There's a feed factor, and that was our fudge factor, right? Um, FUD factor feed, and we call that C. Yeah. Yeah, we get there's a term that relates to the sharpness of the tool or the they call it the tool wear constant. Um, what was that one? Was that W? It was W. And this is tool wear sharpness geometry. It includes the geometry and the wear. And you know, this is kind of also kind of a fudge factor too, isn't it? Geez, that one took more power. The tool must have been dull. That's science. Um, so what else? There's another one, right? Yeah. And there's a constant that's due to the, ooh, that was a close one, the material. And I think they call that KP. And you could call this unit, unit power constant material. So if we know something about the material conditions, if we know something about how sharp the tool is, how fast we're going to feed the tool, so that's not how fast the tool is going to move through the workpiece material, right? What's how fast the tool is going to move through the workpiece material? Yeah. No. What's how fast the tool is going to move through the workpiece material? Service speed. So the cutting edge of the tool, I meant. You cutting edge of the tool, and so that's this velocity, right? That's our surface speed. That's how fast the cutting edge of the tool moves through the workpiece material. All right, so we know those things. We can estimate how much power the cut is going to take. Right. So what, sort of what defines material conditions, do you think, besides the bulk material that you have? What goes into defining the material conditions? What else impacts it? No? Okay. Let's um, document camera. Let's switch over to the document camera. And let's think about how that chip forms on the edge of the tool. Right? So this is all about the power. Everything we're talking about here is about the power as the chip forms on the edge of the tool. Right? Because this power here, this is the power at the cutting tool, not the power at the spindle. If we want to convert the power at the cutting tool to the power at the spindle, what do you think we have to do? Because it's easy to measure the power at the spindle, right? We put an amp meter and a volt meter on there, we get the current, we get power. Easy to measure the power at the spindle. If we want to get the power from the spindle to the power of the cut, what, what do we have to add to our equation? There's some kind of frictiony fudge factor that we use. We call that E for efficiency. And so there's an E factor, and the E factor depends on the type of machine tool you have. And so there's in that machinery's in the machinery's handbook, there's a table of these E factors. And so if it's a milling machine of this style drive unit, we estimate the E factor is going to be this. 
If it's this kind of machine, you estimate the E factor is going to be this. All right, so again, this is based on our input parameters, right? We choose this, material removal rate. This, how did they figure it out? They did experiments, right? And so they made some tables and charts for us. They made some experiments and tables and charts for us. They did a whole boatload of experiments because every different kind of material needs different experiments, right? And this is, again, experimental. So you could have a, a machine that has an E factor of 0.8, which means 80% of the power gets through from the spindle to the cut. Um, and you could have a machine that's that style, that's supposed to have a 0.8, but yours is really good, so maybe it's only a 0.9, or it is a 0.9, so that more of the power gets through. Okay, so, um, all right, we can do that. This power of the cut, though, it happens at the edge of the tool, right? So we had our lathe tool here, and so you guys recognize this? This is a like, lathe cutting tool. It's in a tool block here. So there's a steel piece of uh, piece of steel here. There's a carbide insert that's bolted into it here. So there's a carbide cutting insert. There's actually a carbide shim underneath. You don't have to worry about the shim. It's that carbide cutting insert that interacts with the workpiece material. And so that is moving through the workpiece material. So in our turning, here's an example of a 3D printed turned part. So if we're turning, the workpiece is rotating, right? But the tool itself is not rotating. All right, so that tool is fixed. The workpiece is rotating. And then there's a relative motion in this direction that's the feed. All right, so that makes sense. And so can we see this? As the tool rotates, the chip forms on the edge of the tool. All right, so. We've got some different things that we're looking at here, but what's the velocity direction of the workpiece material with, re with regard to the edge, the cutting edge of the tool right now? In our example here, can you see it? Yeah, there you go. This is a little bit better shading. So what's the relative velocity direction of the workpiece with the cutting edge of the tool in this example? It's straight down, right? Because our, our velocity for any circular thing that's rotating, right? So if we're rotating like this, if this is where the cutting edge of the tool is, the velocity of the workpiece where it hits the cutting edge of the tool is that direction, right? And the velocity over here is that direction if it's rotating this way. Does that make sense? All right, so I did something here, but I don't think it's going to break. So the velocity of the workpiece is in that direction. And so we could actually model that, right? So what we like to do is, as engineers and scientists, we like to understand the problems better. Does that make sense? So, so we can model it. And I've got some, uh, some things that we can cut. Oops. We didn't quite think this through. Open the vise a little bit more. And we want to observe how the chip forms on the edge of the tool. Now, it's possible to do this with like high-speed photography and microscopes inside the machine tool lined up with the cutting edge of the tool. We're going to do it right here live, live experiment in class with our lathe tooling, our workpiece. Can you guys see that workpiece? Should we, should we focus a little bit? Autofocus. Cool there, so it's got something to focus on. So you can see the workpiece. You can see the cutting tool, right? So let's see if and so now I'm moving the cutting tool horizontally, right? But it's the same as a giant workpiece rotating in a lathe. Would you agree? The bigger the diameter of the workpiece, the closer to horizontal the motion is. So I'm moving the cutting tool horizontally across. My work piece here, and when I watch the chip form. You guys got that? Oh, wait, what's the temperature here? It's an experiment. We got to record stuff. 59.6 degrees. Because, because that impacts the material conditions, right? 59.6. 
Okay, that's degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, let's try it again. So we got a workpiece, we got our tool. So I guess I had too much depth of cut. So what happened when I, when I in, so I increased the uncut chip thickness there is what I did, right? When I increased the uncut chip thickness, what happened to the workpiece? It broke off. Yeah, you guys can see that. Sort of broke off, stuck to the tool, it welded itself to the tool. So as we did that, as, the, um, as that tool went in with more uncut chip thickness, excuse me, as that tool went in with more uncut chip thickness, the force went up. Eventually the force went up so high that the bulk material strength was too light and it fractured the part. I get some more work pieces here. Let's take a look at this one. See how, what do we got for temperature? This one's 60, 67 degrees. 67 degrees Fahrenheit. We get our tool. It's coming across. So this one's warmer. You notice the difference in the chip from the first one to this one? All right, let's do one more. And this one is, oh, we switched it to Celsius. That screwed me up. This one's at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so what I know now is that I waited too long to start, and the room temperature ones equaled temperature to room temperature. Um, this was the best one, even though I broke it. So let's go ahead and put it back in, get one more shot of the chip forming here. No, I think I could do this with a starburst also. You guys know what the workpiece material is, right? Butter, Butter makes everything better. Um, so it turns out, and you can do this experiment at home with a butter knife. Uh, there's things that you can change here is you can change the angle of the tool as it interacts with the workpiece, right? So as I'm coming across, if I put this back in here, if I'm coming across like this, I can have the tool be back like that, the cutting edge, or I can have it be tipped like this, right? And have you ever done that with a butter knife? Across the top of the butter, you want just a little bit of butter. So you take the butter knife and you lay it over like this, and then you smear it across the top and some butter comes up and it goes along the edge of the butter knife and it's stuck to the butter knife and then you go put it on your toast. Or you've done that. So when we tip the tool over like that, in this orientation, so the angle of the tool relative to the workpiece here is called the rake angle. When we tip the tool over like that, we're giving it a negative rake angle. If we tip the tool over like this, now if I tip this particular tool over like this, what happens? Is that going to work? Let's do it. So I'll tip it like this. That's a negative break angle. I can get some butter off the top. Right? I can do that all day long. With this particular tool, if I tip it like this, right, that's not going to work. So the way I get a positive break angle is I design it into the tool shape, or I design it into the holder, because we need to have a relief on the back side so that the tool holder itself doesn't gouge through the material. It might have been too big. Got it. Okay. It would have been more fun if that was a starburst. All right. So you guys got that, right? We can model these things. We can experiment with them. I've got some video of doing this in tool steel. Actually, I got a couple videos. Let's look at these. Escape. Mouse, there's butter on everything now. So did I mention that I love butter? 
that butter, in fact, makes everything better? My, uh, my youngest daughter, she also likes butter. And she, uh, she has a tendency to, um, she has a tendency to hide under something when she's doing something she's not supposed to do. And so a couple years ago, I came into the living room and she's under the coffee table. And I said, Emily, what are you doing? Nothing. Emily, what are you doing? And so she's under the coffee table. I, I've, I've told this story before by crawling under the table, but you get the picture. And so, uh, so finally, I didn't believe her. And so I picked up the coffee table because I'm bigger than the coffee table. I can do that. I picked it up and moved it. It went back over. And there she was in the ball with a stick of butter eating it like it was a Snickers bar. <laughs> butter makes everything better. All right, but let's, um, let's, let's take a look at this chip formation here. And so actually, let me pause it and go right back to the start here. All right, so we'll go ahead and look at this. So in this video here, rotation is in this direction, right? We're doing, what kind of operation is this? It is not a facing operation, but I guess since we haven't started feeding yet, you can't know that. Um, if we were to feed, though, in a facing operation, we would feed towards the center of the part here. And that would put all this out here, not in the sort of cutting region of the tool. So what kind of operation is it? OD turning. I am much better with the underhand toss. You guys notice that? Yesterday I was doing them overhand. Not very good at it. I guess I should go out for the softball team. It could be the pitcher. Maybe not. All right, so the workpiece is rotating as it feeds in. And so you saw it go there as it fed in, the chip started to form, and it was curling up on the rake face of the tool. This doesn't pause long enough there. Right. So here's the rake face of my tool. Now, you see this rake face has this little dip in it? So the rake angle here is actually this as it goes into that dip. And so it goes into that dip, and then it comes back out. Anybody know why it goes into the dip and comes back out? The feature on the top of the tool, on the rake face of the tool, is that little, that little ridge there. The, the tool that I used here has one of those, too. So the reason you do that is because if you study cutting operations, long stringy chips indicate that you have a very efficient cutting operation, except for one thing. They wrap around everything. So remember, this workpiece is spinning at, what, 2,000 RPM, something like that? So they wrap around everything. They make a horrible mess. And so we put these little features on the top of the tool so that we change the friction coefficient as the chip goes across the tool. And when you do that, the chip tends to curl up and break. So we would like the chips to break and fly away in little pieces as opposed to become long and stringy. And that's really for safety of the operator and safety of the operation. Okay, so, and this is plastic, and plastic chips never break. They're always long and stringy, but at least they're curling up nicely. So the tool's coming across. If we sketch that, and we zoom out a little bit, and it's going to zoom out, just wait. If we zoom out a little bit, we can know that we have our uncut chip thickness. We've... And, and so that's how much material we're about to remove from the workpiece. Does that make sense? That's the uncut chip thickness. The chip thickness, and notice they're not, I mean, they look almost the same width here, but they are not the same width. The chip thickness is almost always bigger than the uncut chip thickness. Um, and so why is the chip, why isn't it just the same? Well, it turns the corner, right? What happens to deform the chip to make it change shape? Anybody? It gets hot. It does get hot. That's part of it. But but we're 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 actually shearing it. We're changing the local microstructure of the material there. We're we're putting all that energy into it and doing that. So all right. And we've also got right. So 
Depth of cut is here, right? Uncut chip thickness is not equal to depth of cut. Let me state this again. Uncut chip thickness is not equal to depth of cut. Now, what do we think it is equal to? What do you think the uncut chip thickness is equal to? Anybody? No. The incremental depth would be depth of cut. Feed per revolution in certain conditions. So let's look at our turned part here. All right, so here's a model of a... Man, this is why I'm an engineer and not an artist. That's closer. Okay, so here's a model of our turned part. So the part is turning in this direction. Our workpiece is here in blue. Let's, uh, let's put the tool in green. And so here I've got the tool in green. And so with our other example here, where we were cutting across the top of the butter, what orientation were you looking on this picture? So we cut across the top of the butter. We were looking at a side view of the top of the butter, right? But remember, that was as if our part was rotating, I guess, which way was the butter going? This way? So that would have been as if our part was rotating this way in that view, right? Because we got a lateral velocity of the tool. So in this view here, or in, in the view where we cut the butter, we were looking down this edge of the tool. So it's as if we had our eyes lined up with that edge of the tool looking straight down it. And so the rake face of the tool is the top here, as we're seeing in this, in this picture. So we've got the tool there. What direction is feed? To your left. Yes. What direction is surface speed? Into the board, right? Straight into the board from here? Okay, so we've got that, and we've got our chip. And so what the chip was doing there was the chip was sort of feeding out in this direction. And, and so our chip in our video was curling up. but It was sliding out this way and curling up. And it slides along the top of the rake face of that tool as it does that. And so... Our uncut chip thickness here is, I guess this is this way. Our uncut chip thickness is, here's the chip going like this. Okay, the chip's going like this. And so we've got this angle here to deal with. The uncut chip thickness is this direction. And so we have to take into account this angle here, which we call the side edge cutting angle. So T1, our uncut chip thickness, equals the feed in, in distance per revolution, so inches per revolution or millimeters per revolution. Is that on the thing? T1 equals the feed times, so what is it? It's, who, who remembers the Sakatoa thing? Which one is it? Sine or cosine? It's cosine. Of the side edge cutting angle. And so in our example in the um, video that we just looked at, the side edge cutting angle was zero. What's cosine of zero? One. That's how I remember it's cosine, by the way, because I know cosine of zero is one. So if the side edge cutting angle is zero, 
then it is equal to the feed. If there's a positive or a negative side edge cutting angle, it's going to be the feed times cosine of the side edge cutting angle. That's your T1. So that's the value we pick. We get it, we get it from the tool geometry. We choose the side edge cutting angle. Um, T1 is defined. We go back over to the PC here. Uh, so we know that T2, how do we know what T2 is? So T1 we choose. How do we get T2? It's where the Snickers bar. The thickness of the, T2 is the thickness of the chip after it's formed. How do we know T2? Yeah? No. I mean, you, if you, no. If you had the high-speed video camera footage, you could actually calculate it if you knew that and then you knew the shear angle, but no. We usually use this information to find out the shear angle, not the other way around. Anybody? Anybody? I guess I get a Snickers bar because I know the answer. To find out what T2 is, we need to pick the chip up off the bottom of the machine tool. We need to observe T2 by measuring it. Okay. So we got T1, T2. Oh, we don't need to watch the rest of the video. I don't, I don't want to watch the video again. I don't really know how this thing works. Next slide. Okay. Here's another video. And this is an older video. Um, it's a so in the last operation we were doing a OD turning operation, right? In this video, it's actually a facing operation. So now you can have a piece of candy because you said facing last time. And we, we're zoomed in on it. And so let's look here. So you observe. So the tool's going this way. So where's my where's my uncut chip thickness now? It's here, right? And so the main difference between this and what we looked at before is the video is rotated 90 degrees. Okay? And it's, and it's more realistic with what we were looking at here where the relative motion is in this direction, right? So here's our part rotating. Relative motion is in this direction. So we're looking at it flow down the screen here. So chip thickness is here. Uncut chip thickness is here. What's the uncut chip thickness equal to? Uncut chip thickness is not depth of cut. What's the uncut chip thickness equal to? It's written on the whiteboard. Yes. Times. Still written on the whiteboard. Oh, but you can't see that from there. Somebody that can see the whiteboard. In certain cases, it is true. What is it? Times cosine side edge cutting angle. Okay, so T1 is the feed times cosine of the side edge cutting angle. T2, well here, because we've got a microscope, if we calibrate it, we could measure it on the screen, right? If we had put a Snickers bar in the frame, and we knew how long the Snickers bar was, we could measure the Snickers bar, we could measure the thickness, right? And so what is that, like one, two, three, four, it's about six Snickers bars? Well, it could be a unit of measurement, right? Okay, so we got our uncut chip thickness, our chip thickness. As it goes through there. And so what do you notice as it's going through there? What do you observe as you watch the chip form on the edge of the tool? Somebody, give me an observation. If it's your observation, it has to be correct. So we're noticing that the chip T2 is thicker than T1. What else do we notice as we look at this? Yeah. Oh, right. Like right here, it looks like it's a little bit thicker. Yeah. I think I observe that too. I don't know if you always observe that. But as, and it's, it's easier to see as we see the motion of it. 
see back up just a little bit to get some more motion. So one of the things that's really striking to me when I look at that is that here I've got workpiece, here I've got chip, and right at the spot, the interface between workpiece and chip, you see relative motion between workpiece and chip. So there's relative motion between workpiece and chip right at the interface. Where that interface is happening, we call that the shear plane or the shear zone, some people call it, because it changes in width a little bit, right? It's not, it's not truly a plane, but it aligns with a, with a plane. So we call that, that spot where you've got that relative motion, the shear plane. This is my first ever video animation that I ever did. I, I was very proud of it for a while. This also is one of my most watched YouTube videos ever posted. I don't know why but I don't think you ever actually know why. Uh, we've got a workpiece, we've got a chip, we've got a tool. I should really update this because I've gone to a new color scheme. <clears throat> right now I always draw the tool in green, the chip in red, the workpiece in blue. Um, all right, it's gonna go, what's gonna happen? T1, T2. This is like, like why do people watch this? It's too freaking long. It's about to rotate. No. no, no. If you look at the average length, <coughs> if you ever, if you ever look at YouTube analytics and stuff like that, you can tell at what point in your video everybody clicks away. It still counts as a view, but it doesn't count as cumulative watch time. And uh, and so what people do when they look at this, if if everybody clicks away at 15 seconds into the video, at 15 seconds into the video you put a link that pops up to link them to another one of your videos to keep them on your channel. Pro tip, YouTube analytics. All right, but we get chip, workpiece, tool. Okay. Why do we care? I mean, it's fun. I get to cut butter in class. Although there will be a class where I light stuff on fire too, so you should, you should come to that one. It's fun. Why do we care? Why do we just spend, what was it, almost 40 minutes talking about this? You guys don't care, do you? He doesn't care. <laughs> no, that looks better. Why do we care? Power equals force times velocity, right? We could also estimate power, what it should be, if we know something about the machine. What happens if the force gets too big? Tool breaks. What happens if we exceed the available power of the machine tool. Sometimes. Sometimes the machine tool breaks, right? So, I mean, we heard it in our cutting operation there. We heard the tool slow down, right? So our mini mill, oh! Right? That's what it sounds like when the machine tool runs out of power. Oh! And, and what happens if the spindle stops because it slowed down, but the, the feed continues? Yeah. <laughs> Tool breaks. Is that what you're gonna say? Or you could shove everything aside. Yeah. Oh, we've got when we talk about fixturing, we've got some good pictures of parts that didn't stay fixtured. We talk about that next week. All right. So we care about it in part. Well, what if? What if we could do something? to make the power go down? What if we could do, so if we made the power go down, the force would go down, right? If we could make the force go down, what could we do? Cut faster? If we could, if we could reduce the force, because if, as we try to, so increase material removal rate, right? So if I can make force go down for the same available power, I could, Increase my velocity, right? If I increase my velocity, that's cool because I can make chips faster. The goal of machine shops is to make chips. Fill buckets with chips. Shouldn't be the goal of machine shops. It is the goal of many machine shops, fill buckets with chips. And they, they rate their productivity by how full the chip buckets get, how quickly. When is that, when is that okay? 
it's okay if it's a good process, so it doesn't have a lot of waste in the process, and there's customers that want to buy the parts as fast as you can make them. Then it's okay to judge your productivity by how fast you can fill up the chip buckets, because it's the same as how fast can you ship the parts. Okay, but if we can adjust things in the cutting process, if we can understand the cutting process better, we can do things to improve our, effic our efficiency, right? So let's think about this chip forming on the edge of the tool. We got what? Five minutes left? Good. 10 minutes left? All right, so we've got, you know what happens if you wash one of these whiteboards with Windex? You wash off the coating that makes the whiteboard marker not stick to the whiteboard. You know what I think happened? Somebody washed this whiteboard with Windex. Um, all right. Document camera. Here we go. We have our chip here. Let's start with the tool. And so does this matter if it's a turning operation or a milling operation? We're, we're clearly doing our modeling with turning operation here, right? In fact, we're, we're doing it with a very special kind of turning operation called an orthogonal turning operation, um, where we, could, we basically ignore everything that happens on the edges. All we care about is what's happening in the steady state, sort of in the middle of this, as is happening. And, and so why do we do that? Because the math is easier. Do that to make the math easier. As engineers, when we do modeling. As scientists, when we do modeling, we'd like the math to be easier. So we're doing that there. My workpiece is flowing past. So that's an ABC surface, already been cut, flowing fast. I've got my workpiece that's approaching, right? So this is my T1. Right, there's my T1. I've got my chip, let's see, here, flowing off in that direction. And so I've got a chip. I've got a boundary here, and so this is my T2. Here, right? So if I get a ratio of T1 to T2, we can call that the chip thickness ratio. T1 over T2 equals R that's our chip thickness ratio. And that tells us something about the cut, right? It, it, sort of, it sort of implies something about how much energy went into the cut by that ratio, because that the bigger the difference between the two of them, the more you had to modify the material. Does that kind of make sense? So the other thing we notice here is we've got, so this angle here, like this is the rake angle, right? That was when we tipped our tool like this or like this in the butter experiment. So that's the rake angle. And we can measure that here. Let's call it alpha. That's our rake angle, and it's related to the tool geometry. You get the rake angle from the tool geometry, so I drew it in green. This angle here, in between where we have workpiece and we have chip, that's where our shear plane goes. Right? So the shearing is happening in there. I suppose I should make this a dashed line because it's coming out now. There's, not, there's no material up there. But that's our shear angle. And so our shear angle, from the geometry of this layout, we can actually figure out what the shear angle is. Understanding what that shear angle is. So if the shear angle was to come way down like this, right? Would you assume that that takes more or less energy? Right, because that shear plane got bigger. So if the shear plane gets bigger, there's more energy in the cut. If the shear plane came up like this, then we might have less energy. Good thing I'm not throwing those today. <laughs> right, so, um, so understanding that shear plane can help us understand a lot about the cutting operation. So shear plane, oh, so Anybody know what the geometric relationship is here then? You figure it out with trig, can't you? Right? Who could figure it out with trig? Everybody raise your hands quick. Good, we could all figure it out with trig. Tangent 
of the shear angle equals RT, so that's our chip thickness ratio, cosine alpha divided by 1 minus RT sine alpha. It should be obvious, but you hate it when the math guy says that. We've left out a few steps, right? But you can all prove this. Yeah? I once gave that as an extra credit homework assignment to this class. And I said, if you can prove mathematically that this statement is true, I'll give you some number of bonus points on the final grade. So I wanted to make sure that I could prove it mathematically before I assigned it to class. So I used like 20 pieces of paper and spent all weekend making sure that I, un I really understood the solution here. And then I got about eight different solutions back from the class. And what I realized, because of the way I made the statement of the problem and the assumptions that I allowed people to make, any one of those eight other solutions might also be correct. So then I had to rework the math on everybody else's eight solutions to see whether or not they were correct, as well as me being correct. Because if you give too much information, there's more than one way to solve the problem. Yeah, I won't make that mistake again. There's no extra credit for proving this to me. I believe it's true. I have faith. I'm a faithful person. I believe it's true. All right, so tangent of the shear angle equals RT cosine alpha over 1 minus RT sine alpha. That's cool, because we know if we can adjust that shear angle, we can change how much force it takes to make the cut, how much power it takes to make the cut, right? P equals F times V. What's the force? of the tool on the workpiece or the tool on the chip here, the workpiece chip system. What's the direction of the force? Because the problem is both of these are vectors, right? Force is a vector. We know this from physics. Force has direction. Velocity is a vector. We know this from physics. Velocity has direction, right? What's the, uh, what's the force that the tool is exerting on the workpiece? What direction is it? So not the magnitude. We can do math to figure out the magnitude later. We can do math to figure out the magnitude there, right? What direction is the velocity first? That one's easier. In my picture here, what direction is the velocity? Straight sideways, right? Whoa, you're not looking. You answered the question, I threw you the candy. Velocity is this direction. Right? Velocity is that direction. And so we know the force has to have a component in that direction too, if this is true. If power equals force times velocity. So that force has got to have a component in that direction. Too much butter on my fingers to open the whiteboard markers. So there's a component of the force in this direction, which we call FC, the cutting force. Now, think about the think about the relative motion here, though. Right, the chip is flowing in that direction relative to the tool. Is that true? Because we we saw it happen in the video, right? The chip is flowing. There's friction between the chip and the tool, right? So doesn't there also have to be a component of the chip pushing the tool that way and the tool pushing that direction? There has to be, right? Otherwise, the tool would accelerate away with the chip, right? If we don't have a force counteracting that friction, the chip would accelerate away so there's some sort of frictional force here that's lined up in that direction. Um, I think we just call that F. I'll have to look at my notes to make sure. There's a frictional force there. And there's stuff happening in the, rake, in the, uh, in the shear plane, right? 
right? So as the chip was sliding this direction, it was like pushing on the workpiece in that direction, wasn't it? Right, so there's, there's, there's forces that line up with the shear plane. There's forces that line up with the friction plane. There's force that lines up with the direction of velocity because we know that that statement is true because math makes it true, right? The unit's canceled. So we have actually three different orthogonal force systems that all have to add together to the same resultant force. We've got a force system that's associated with the friction here. And it has to equal the force system that's associated with the cutting force. And so this force we push down here, right? So there's a component in this direction, a component in that direction. Those are orthogonal forces. There's no way I was going to get two of them in a row. Those are orthogonal forces, FC and FT. That's the thrust force that's being supplied to push this direction. There's a resultant force, P. That's the total force of the tool acting on the workpiece chip system, is that FP. We can, we can break it down into components that line up with the shear plane and perpendicular to the shear plane. We can break it down into components that line up with the friction plane and perpendicular to the friction plane. What do we call that force perpendicular to friction? Normal force, right? And we can break it up into cutting force and thrust force. What we're going to spend the first half of tomorrow doing is reviewing how we go from one of these orthogonal systems to another orthogonal system. That makes sense? Because we can know stuff about friction and we can do stuff to reduce the friction forces. How do we reduce the friction force there? Coolant will help us change the friction coefficient there. Change the temperature will help change the friction coefficient there. How do we change the shear force? Change material. Get a different material, you can change that shear, what's happening in the shear plane. How do we change the cutting force, this FC? We can, we can change our, our cutting properties. So we can change that material removal rate. We'll make that FC go down or up. All right. So first half of tomorrow, we're going to talk about that stuff. Second half of tomorrow, we're going to introduce the concepts of stress and strain. And as we get closer to the end of the term, I know you're all going to be feeling more and more stress. And it may cause strain. And we'll actually talk about tomorrow in class how the same stress and strain that we see in engineering impacts us as people. And there are tools that we can use to reduce the strain, or reduce the stress, which then reduces the strain. There will be less butter tomorrow. Yes. I have to bribe my students to pay attention. Hey, we also had butter. Demonstrating cutting forces in machining by machining butter on camera. And you're live on YouTube right now. That's okay with me, but. So, uh, I sent you an email. I'm not very good at email. In the 